Good morning, everybody. It's your deacon, Dorothy Pierce. Haven't seen a lot of you in a while, but I do think about you all the time. You are constantly in my love, in my prayers, and my very best thoughts. It is such a blessing to, to be with you this morning, the third Sunday of Lent. If you have your hymnal handy by any chance, you could turn to page 470 and sing along with me on the first verse. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior. There is healing in his blood. Those are really good words for the third Sunday of Lent. A wideness in God's mercy for each and every one of us. Let's start with a moment of silence. And this is a morning prayer from Kenya. O oh God, you have let us pass the night in peace. Let us pass the day in peace. Wherever we may go upon our way, which you have made peaceable for us, O oh God, lead our steps. When we have spoken, keep lies away from us. When we are hungry, keep us from murmuring. When we are satisfied, keep us from pride. Calling upon you, we pass the day. O oh Lord, you are our Lord. Amen. The Collect for Lent 3. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for uh, the third Sunday of Lent is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. These, will, these words will be familiar to you. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day, and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, 
so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 19, and I'm just going to read verses 7 through 10, so I encourage you to read the whole psalm on your own. This particular portion is very poetic, it's very beautiful, and it goes like this. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. The epistle reading is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Brothers and sisters, for Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, if you have your hymnals handy, we will sing the first verse of 488. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. All else be not to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Our gospel reading today is from John the second chapter, verses 13 through 25. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. 
when he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now some words about the scripture that we have just heard for the third Sunday of Lent. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My husband, Andy, you know Andy, and I recently watched a movie entitled Never Too Late. In this movie, four men, former POWs, who had years before successfully escaped a prison camp in Vietnam, were now trying to make a break from a nursing facility so that one of the men could connect with a woman he had wanted to marry all those years before when, before he had gone off to serve in the war. It's a sweet movie. It is alternately mixed with some poignant, sometimes serious, and a whole lot of funny moments. One of the more serious moments in the movie, which is a recurring theme and touched me very deeply, occurred when one of the men, Jack, was asked, doesn't everyone deserve a happy ending? Doesn't everyone deserve a happy ending? I think this is an excellent question to reflect upon during this Lenten season as we all prepare for the resurrection, new life, and joy that God continues to promise to us as we move with Jesus closer and closer to Easter, believing deep in our hearts and souls that there is a happy ending beyond any difficulties and any kind of challenges that we are experiencing in our lives. The answer is yes, everyone does deserve not only a happy ending, but a blessed and happy life right now. The scripture readings that we just heard seem to speak to the very heart of this question, doesn't everyone deserve a happy ending? I think if we listen carefully, we could actually hear a resounding yes in each passage, along with some specific things that we can and must do to allow God to work happiness, hope, and blessings into our lives. In the Exodus reading, we heard the Decalogue, or what we commonly call the Ten Commandments, which were constructed to ensure proper functioning of the newly formed Israelite society. People were learning to adjust to life outside the confines of Egypt and Pharaoh's oppressive regime. So God set up some guidelines for them. It was not, we believe, not intended to further oppress the people, but to assure them a happy ending to the life that they had had to endure in Egypt. We heard God starting out by saying something to the effect, I saved you, I love you. These requirements are meant to help build a beautiful relationship between us and also for you with all the other people that you interact with in life, your family, your friends, your co-workers, the world. We could almost hear God saying, these laws are my gift to you. God then and now is not meaning to squeeze some impossible restrictions upon us, but to show everyone how to discover and enjoy true freedom, to fall into a rhythm that goes beyond oppression, beyond pain and pandemic, beyond any of the hard places of our daily human existence. God seems to know that human beings need boundaries, rules, guidelines, that we need limitations to make certain that we and others are safe. God wants us to be safe and have a happy life and a happy ending. 
God intends that for each one of us. I only read a little part of Psalm 19, but I hope you'll read all of it on your own so that you can hear the yes to that question in that psalm. David, who is the psalmist, writes that the law of the Lord that we just heard about in Exodus is valuable. It's rich. It's sweeter than anything that we can imagine tasting. Perhaps we could almost hear David and God encouraging us to read all scripture carefully, soulfully, so we can hear God speaking afresh to us in every word and to hear, especially in the Psalms, ourselves speaking afresh to God. We don't want to see these as dusty, tired, old words. They are the living, breathing, often poetic words of God. We could think, what living, breathing, poetic words have we spoken to God and to each other lately? We could go back and read Psalm 19 again, especially verses 7 through 10, and read it as if it were a love letter and find ourselves speaking to God and then really listening to God, heightening our gratitude to God. Thank you, God, for the blessings of life. Lent is a perfect time to do this for ourselves and for others because we do, all of us, deserve a happy ending to a happy life. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we hear a reminder that working for our human deserved happiness is a huge challenge, <laughs> not just because we are faced with so many difficulties and issues, but because there are things that we can and should change in ourselves. This is Lent, this is what we do, and we do it all the time. It's going to take a lot of work. It will require much commitment to do those things. What God, what Paul asked of the people at Corinth, Paul's saying, turn directly to God, pray, and believe that we can clean up our lives. Paul had his hands full with the people at Corinth. He was concerned about the, their moral conduct, often inappropriate behaviors, their theological debates, and confusions and divisions in their families, in the community, and the church. We know about all of these challenges. This sounds familiar to us. So Paul is speaking to us as well. Doesn't everyone deserve a happy ending? Yes. During Lent and at all the times in our lives, we can put our faith on the same emphasis that we hear in the words of John's Gospel, that we must strive to have an authentic encounter with God, with the divine. In John's Gospel, chapter 2 contains two dramatic examples of such a divine encounter and power as displayed in the person of Jesus. You know, we hear the second one today of Jesus cleansing the temple at Jerusalem. Just prior to that is the one where Jesus was changing water into a delicious wine at the wedding at Cana. This is a foreshadowing of what is promised to us as we enter God's kingdom. There is abundance. There is happiness. There is forgiveness. There is salvation. And we will not be disappointed as we wait patiently for the manifestation of God's kingdom, alive and breathing, sometimes poetic, in our lives. There is new life ahead. Jesus was not speaking about tearing down the physical temple. He was speaking of his death and subsequent resurrection, which has always been intended to include us. We will die, and we will be resurrected with Christ. We can escape many of the situations that infringe on our health and happiness. Jesus changing water into wine, spilling those coins, we can just picture it, tipping over the tables of the money changers, throwing out the cattle and the sheep. Give us hope. <laughs> That's hope. There are things that we can spill out of our lives. There are things that we can do to help ourselves and others tip over the tables of 
bad habits and behaviors, to throw out unnecessary and unhealthy attitudes, actions, biases, old routines and practices so that we can experience the coming of a real throbbing, wonderful change in our souls. Yes, we can experience the movement of a happy, productive walk with Christ. Lent reminds us of a lot of things, especially that it is never too late to seek the happy ending God has always prepared for us. Remember, the answer is yes. Amen. prayers of the people. And I encourage you, wherever you are, to, to add your own prayers for yourself and for others. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Didi, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all of us who serve God in his church. We pray for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. We pray for all our public servants, including those serving in our armed forces and law enforcement, especially Nate, Mason, Davis, Amelia, Beth, Paul, Philip, Matt, Robbie John, Nick, Josh, Trevor, Thomas, Vincent, and Kate. We pray for all who are sick or suffering, including Mark, Ruth, Lynn, Leslie, Colleen, Patrick, Terry, John, Leslie Ann, Bill, Doug, Tom and Julia, Bob, Chuck, Barbara, Lillian, and Claire. May they know your healing and your peace. We pray for those who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Hear us, Lord for we know your mercy is great. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go now to will and to work for God's purposes. Let the same mind be in each one of us that was in Christ Jesus. May we be filled with the same love and look to the interests of others. We go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, God uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. 
Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we meet again. I hope you all have a wonderful day. I love you. You are always in my heart and on my mind and definitely in my prayers. Have a wonderful day.